Okay, sorry everyone for the for the audio troubles. I guess Loda will be with us in a second again. Um, so this is the panel with the slightly cumbersome title "Regulation versus Governance: Who is Marginalized, Who is Privileged, and Is Privacy the Right Focus?" Um, so, so I think what we've all learned over the last um, couple of panels over the last hours of today is that many of us have been thinking about um, <clears throat> security and privacy needs for certain groups of people that we often refer to as marginalized. I'm, I'm not even sure if that's a good term anymore because there seem to be so many of these groups of people that it really affects like a um, huge group of the population. Um, we've also been talking about how these these security and privacy requirements or needs often intersect directly with safety requirements for these groups of people, for these communities. Um, and we're talking about online safety as well as direct physical safety. And we've also listened a little bit about um, or learned a little bit about what people expect, how digital, pl digital platforms should behave in order to cater for um, people's safety security needs, but also for their direct safety. And I think in, in this panel, we want to distill this a little bit again, um, but look at rather specific examples from a couple of communities that we have personal experience with. So um, I'm Jan Tobias Mühlberg, I'm a researcher at Kiel Löwen, and, and one of the aspects that I've been working is, is people on the move, some papier community specifically, um, and there we see groups of people who need to interact with digital platforms, often being aware that their data traces can become a problem for them personally, for their own safety, for their visa applications, for their um, proceedings in migration procedures and so forth. Um, we just had the EDPS Civil Society Summit that was looking into that specific topic and raising a couple of points there. Another community that we want to look into specifically are sex workers who need to use online platforms to advertise their services, to communicate with clients, specifically in, in times of corona, um, and who have concerns about their own safety while using these platforms, um, but also about being to some extent exploited by these platforms for, for advertising purposes, by these platforms for using their own materials, but also are constantly at the risk of just being shut down from certain platforms by regulation, by um, um, platforms deciding that this kind of services are not appropriate anymore for the audience, things like that. And on, on this specific topic, we have um, Lola here, who's a representative of uh, Utsopi, that's the Belgian sex work community. And we have this, uh, Dr. Elisa Redmiles here, who works at the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems, and who has a long experience in working um, on security and privacy needs of sex workers. And another community we actually want to look in are our children and their interactions with, for example, educational platforms or online gaming platforms and um, how these platforms potentially exploit data of these subjects and how they might potentially subject um, 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 children to forms of discrimination or, or other forms of ex exploitation based on the data traces they leave on these platforms. We were planning to have Professor um, Patricia Garcia here as one of the speakers from the University of Michigan, who has been working with um, black girls in educational communities in the US. Unfortunately, she cannot make it for personal and COVID related reasons. We still have Tommaso Krepax here from Santa, uh, from Santa Ana in Pisa who has been working partly together with me on this topic and who will share a little bit of their insights on um, um, data collection in online games and what that might potentially mean for children and, and to what extent parents can even protect the data subjects in that case from app use. And then coming from, from these different points, we want to talk about how we see platform governance and how we want platforms to protect people's safety, people's well-being and um, cater for their subject rights. So my 
wish would be, since I still don't see Lola in the chat and in the audio channel, my wish would be that um, Tommaso starts with talking a little bit about what you work on and what you found out. And then maybe we can switch to Lola and get some hands-on experience on how the situation looks for sex workers. Tommaso, the floor is yours. Perfect. Very, thank you very much, Anto Bias, for the introduction. And thank you very much to all the panelists. Um, I feel like what I'm about to say, at least in the beginning, is going to sound quite familiar to many, if not most of you. Uh, however, the, the fact that something so obvious still today must be restated in January 2022 is pretty much self-explanatory as to why it is important indeed to find new solutions, even to old problems. Now, uh, let me start with a quote. Um, the defining industry of our time is the capture and resale of it's not personal data, it is capture and resale of human attention. And these are the, team, the, the words of Tim Wu, who is summarizing the attention economy, where not data, but attention is the new oil. But wait a minute, we, we've all been told over and over again along these years that data was the new oil. So if, but if human attention is the new oil, what is the role of data in the attention economy? Now, the competition among big tech giants to predominate in this attention economy sparked the uh, Knowles Barrow Baird arms race uh, to find the most efficient techniques to engage and preserve users' attention. And this is nothing new. They use dark patterns, they use nudges, they use sludges, and all sorts of other forms of manipulation. Really. Now, this arm race uh, brings up an attention war. Uh, and in this attention war, digital is firmly at the center, and rights, unfortunately, are left at the margins. Um, in the tension war, you can easily imagine who are the civilians, um, to which category will belong amongst the civilians, the casualties, unfortunately, and who in the society, together with their rights, is left at the margin. Now, uh, the hyper-personalization of both dark pattern, which is what makes us fall in the trap, and of hyper-personalization of the content, that's what keeps us in the trap, is possible thanks to the collection and analysis of, well, surprise, surprise, gigantic amount of personal information. And that's the answer to our question. So human attention is the oil still, but personal data is the drill that's used to extract it. To extract it. Now, um, the, the, this economic, the whole economic system is so wide reaching and so pervasive that it generated a global problem, really, of digital manipulation, digital addiction. If you want to know more about it, there's uh, Zuboff, who's written plenty about it, but also like, you know, Martin, like, I mean, Snowden, Hal Variant, and, and all, all, all of those. Um, this system is, unfortunately, exacerbated at one paradigmatic commercial example, which also together with Dan Tobias, we studied uh, quite uh, recently, uh, which we call the ultimate data collection, manipulation, and addiction machine, which is uh, free to play online games. Those that many of you call like in the name of freemiums. So these are games which have a data-driven business model, which is based on fully on personal data analytics, fueled technically on the one side by machine learning, AI, and whatnot, and economically by predatory marketing tactics, even neuromarketing tactics. Now, um, these online games literally use thousands of what to call sticky features to um, hijack users' minds. Um, you have day login, strike rewards, uh, rewards for ad watching, uh, you have timed alerts, push notifications, uh, the use of, of red icons, uh, summons for, for when you're already out of the game that keeps you on the loop constantly. Back in the trap, stay in the trap. Now, because freemies are free to play, then of course they're vastly played by younger children. So of course everyone uses those games, but mostly children. But just to sum up, so these freemies are a paradise or perhaps a hell for children profiling, children manipulation, and children addiction. Just really let it sink in. These are services that are created with principles of addiction by design, not privacy, and compulsion by design in their core mechanics. And well, the risks are pretty high. Um, children are exposed to psychological, social, physical, 
and mental health risks. Like not long ago, the World Health Organization has included gaming disorder in the international classification of disorders and diseases. Well, I, my nephew is only nine years old and he has been for years the praise of the Googles, the Metas, the Ubisoft, the Roblox, the GAFAM, the Gamma, whatever you call them, that's feasting on his attention. Uh, and these are the most, of course, critical years for his upbringing, and, and that's without even knowing it, and his parents knowing it. And um, with repercussions that will perhaps endure forever if you've written, read the permanent record. Now, the power imbalance is really what's shocking me the most. Uh, these are, uh, to rephrase uh, Wilson, godlike technologies taking advantage of children's palliative emotions. My question is, as, as, as a lawyer in, and a researcher in this, is, is how, how do we get, even get there? So uh, as for law, well, the practical implementations in the EU human rights, but also consumer law, and up until recently, this the service regulation, have failed the test of digital reality, mostly due to, I'd say, three plus reasons. One is the discounting of negative effects on children, of the future of children. One other one, and we've been discussing this today, it's the overestimation of supervisory authorities' capabilities uh, versus the, in, well, on the one hand, the data protection as law of everything, as Portola would say it, and the enforcement paralysis that we've seen in recent years, uh, which are, of course, linked. Um, a general fixation on risk-based regulation, uh, which relies on notice and consent, which does not account for well, the, privacy the privacy paradox, the privacy calculus, which is discounted by cognitive biases. And what's most interesting to me is, in the words of Sartori is that the fact that data subjects opportunity to, to consent to risks that they do not understand for good reasons is not an asset for them, but a liability. But there's one more thing. Um, we claim that the failure is due to a fundamental error in the detection of the asset to protect. This asset, in fact, is not the human right to privacy, let alone data protection, but something that goes beyond privacy. Now, what is that and how do we fix this? A hint to the solution was indicated by the, the Council of Europe in 19, when uh, they produced a declaration on the manipulative capabilities of algorithm processes. And I'm going to read about it. So they say, fine-grained, subconscious, and personalized level of algorithm persuasion may have significant effects on the cognitive autonomy of individu individuals, yada, 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 which may weaken the exercise and enjoyment of individual human rights and to the corrosion of the very foundation of the Council of Europe. Now, um, what is the solution? Well, in, in my opinion, and not only my opinion, uh, Susie Allegri is another one um, that has this opinion before me, probably, is that the right to privacy, as in self determination, the right to autonomy, when applied to certain kinds of digital manipulation and addiction, shall be upgraded, read under the lenses of the right to freedom of thought. Um, of course, it is perhaps too naive right now to think that, okay, such a grade should immediately apply to uh, everyone without overturning the surveillance capitalistic system. We all know it's going to, it's here to stay for a while. Anyhow, um, during times of war, the attention war, we should at least maybe have the decency <laughs> to save the most vulnerable, which in my understanding, amongst which at least are children. Now, um, the Committee on the Rights of the Child in General Comment 25 uh, it says that it state that states parties should respect the right of the child to freedom of thought. State parties should prohibit practices that manipulate or interfere with children's right to freedom of thought. And this is the first time in which we are talking about freedom of thought in U, um, in the UNCRC. Now, to 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 end, the correct shield for children against digital manipulation addiction is the absolute human right of freedom of thought. And make no mistake. Privacy is not an absolute right. It's only qualified. So, because, because freedom of thought is absolute, it cannot lawfully be interfered with, no matter how important the, the public interest is, and no matter what other qualified human right will the, the big tech come out with to legitimize children manipulation. And, and that's pretty much what I think about the topic. 
Okay, that's a good starting point. Um, I, I'm, I'm, so we have Lola back. So I'm really happy. We have a pretty much complete panel. Thanks a lot for being here. Um, I think, so after having heard Tommaso's opinion on children protection online games, I think I would want to have a round with Lola on sex workers on their perceived and, and real privacy and security requirements and how you see platforms and how you 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 feel that platforms protect your safety or do not. So, Loda, the floor is yours. You're muted. You are muted, Lola. Yes, I'm unmuted now. I'm so sorry. Uh, I have a way with technology that it uh, doesn't always work out with me. So thank you, Jan Tobias. Um, my name is Lola and I'm speaking for Utsupi. Utsupi is a union in support of sex worker rights in Belgium since 2015, run by sex workers and allies. Uh, the work we do consists of uh, political work concerning the decriminalization of sex work in Belgium and also providing social cynical support in different places around Belgium, um, Brussels and Flanders. Um, as an organization, we don't really have um, researched expertise on privacy and safety yet, uh, so rather a basic understanding of how, how it's lived and how digital spaces are perceived safe or not for sex workers. Um, so doing the field work and since sex workers are experts of their own reality, I'm going to speak from this perspective um, based on the questions we get to deal with in the community work. Um, <clears throat> I think that internet um, also has provided substantial benefits for sex workers. Uh, in general, it made it easier for people, more people in the industry to um, find each other and fully organize their own work and logistics. Downside on the cyber workspace for sex workers are mostly matters of access, privacy, safety, algorithmic biases that kind of exclude and police um, sex worker businesses. So this is an impact we should also be studying on um, Belgian terms. And yeah, of course, sex worker identities are dependent on the internet uh, as a site for um, in, like informational exchange to gather, find community, to use practical tools for payment, uh, digital communication with clients, self-advertisements. So how do we kind of keep it clean? Um, how do we prevent cross-contamination uh, across different accounts and devices? How do we minimize uh, the likelihood of our personal information being leaked and shared? So in taking care of our online behavior as sex workers, we kind of want to secure our own sex worker identities but also secure the identity of our clients who often have as big as a wish in staying anonymous. Uh, we want to secure the community and our colleague workers and also secure third parties like family and friends, co-workers from potential exposure and uh, stigmatization. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, little tips I think of and I give the people I work with are exactly also using different browsers for different profiles. Uh, try not to share your location with your apps too many times. Use end-to-end -end encrypted communication. Try to not mix so much your working profiles and your private devices. Be mindful about um, how and where you use your uh, legal name on social media. So I think it's very basic um, prevention and protection. Uh, as I say, we're not really experts. Um, um, I'm not yet the, the sexy tech, tech nerds I wish to be. Um, but yes, uh, sex work is embodied work. So for many workers, it means a good separation of the work in a private sphere. And that's a boundary 
between the physical and the digital that actually overlaps while working, which makes it not easy to protect your information either. So in our physical spaces, when we host clients at home, for example, we also go through the process of removing sensitive information, covering up photos, covering up letters, official documents, etc. everything that gives away like identity. So people cannot like name search and find us on our private profiles. And this is uh, similar to how we should kind of behave um, online where we need to practice a good um, digital hygiene um, yeah, so example, um, we had a sex worker whose clients did find out their legal name. Um, so next what happened is um, they got uh, an announced presence at their address. Um, this is an example in the physical world, but uh, an online scenario is um, where uh, a client's fixation for a sex worker who is a member of us led to threatening to expose them, which the client then uh, pursued by creating a fake profile, pro a Facebook profile and a fake Facebook page. And it led to the profile being... Uh, getting rid of, but the page we could not delete because of different policy or something. So it's a lot of difficulties uh, in these things. Um, but yeah, these are still very up-to-date scenarios uh, workers come to us about rather than official instances like police and such. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the general fears and concerns from the community um, stem from the fear of being doxxed. Having your uh, having the laws of privacy and having your personal information shared, being outed as a sex worker. So, in terms of prevention and harm reduction, uh, this is something social support organizations uh, should be definitely informed about. And fear of losing privacy is also a reflection of a state of surveillance and censorship under which sex workers operate. Thinking about losing access to services, the platform deep platformation by uh, algorithms and as we know algorithms also have proved kind of a lack uh, to like a moral fiber so it's really hard by the rules they um, they make up if um, algorithms are not able to distinguish, distinguish like nuances between what is pleasurable and what is problematic um <clears throat> Same fears for financial systems, uh, digital financial transaction. Um, to be email services and apps are willingly wanting to be linked to a sex worker's income. So that makes sex workers often suspicious of using digital payment platforms. Since it's also linked to our personal information, the fear is uh, what if? Uh, all of our data is getting collected and sold to someone who is going to out us. Uh, what if our activities are being monitored? What if I will lose my social support because of that? What if I'm committing federal crime? What if um, a lot of questions? So just to illustrate that even like mundane tasks like banking and payments actually have a way to them, which is very annoying. A lot. Um, yeah, just to, to highlight that safety in all means is something sex workers are very uh, concerned and occupied with. We just want to have a stress free and healthy and normal life, and safety in the field will mean many different things to many different people. Uh, considering all of the diversity in identities we want to protect. And the anonymity remaining anonymous is one big way to do so. I think that really helps uh, as, a, as a protection. And it's not just a brainless action. It's actually whole work on itself, um, remaining private. Because we, uh, sex workers just also use a lot of different devices for a lot of different accounts like email accounts social media accounts sex worker profiles kinky profiles payment processes all these things and we reach out to a lot of different people which being clients um our community again or 
personal spheres. So that leaves a light behind a lot of traces, um, meaning a lot of data needs to be protected. Yeah. How can technology become beneficial towards seeing um, freeing futures for sex work and help create sex positive spaces online? I do wonder because I don't know, don't have answers. I just work in the fields. Um, I think of definitely super secure and stable platforms. Again, payments, secure, secure payments, making sure you are getting paid and not being flagged by your bank. I think of, it could be nice to have some kind of like a mutual feedback with the client and the worker where you can leave both like positive and negative feedback, kind of like a, you can do a self-screening in who you would like to work with. Of course, not everyone is um, in a position to deny, um, deny clients. Uh, I think what's also important is a nuance in flagging, making sure not we don't uh, see threats of violence the same way as a client not showing up, which is also very annoying and happens so often and you lose time and money over it, especially when you're the one who's moving towards the space, but it's not the same way we should alarm um, these profiles. I think of a moderation on platforms. Um, Red Light is actually doing a really good job on this. Um, they're uh, also screening whoever is underage, filtering them out, uh, going against uh, forms of exploitation and harm. So um, monitoring to have a safe space to find your clients at, communicate, you know, like your advertisements. Um, so yeah, this is very general, I think. Um, based on uh, the more fears that come up, definitely payments, privacy and such. Um, and now I thought about a bit my, uh, about my position um, doing community work in Utsupi. I think it is good for me to, or for us to start think of response plan. Um, think about what do we want to protect? Who do we want to protect it from? What are the implications of having that information shared? Um, what are the risks? What are we going to take seriously and what not? Um, and really help. Um, I mean, the, the legal status of sex work in Belgium is non-existent. So it's not that there's many ways we can help ourselves um, since we have a tolerated status of sex work. Uh, a decriminalization would already be, like, would be heaven. A lot of more possibilities in being safe. Um, what also could be good for organizations like us uh, is collaboration in hosting workshops for sex workers and gaining more insights in crypto payments, everything like with tokens uh, and yeah, yeah. alternative okay. payments online. Yeah, yes. thank you. Interesting perspectives, very personal perspectives as well. Um, maybe if we now move to Elisa, we can take a step back because you have maybe data on the bigger picture, what happens internationally on the on the sex worker scene and how people protect themselves and what the safety and, and, and privacy requirements are there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I wanted to pick up a couple of threads um, that Lola has brought up. And so the context um, for what I'll speak about is some of the empirical work in our own group, um, which consists of both sex working researchers as well as allies who are academic researchers. Um, and we have studied sex workers in the EU as well as um, sex workers who do work in the US, although uh, primarily that has been with folks who have switched to online work. Um, mm -hmm. in the US context. Um, so the first part was kind of this piece of, of deplatforming. And I think for some of the folks in the panel, like one of the questions I often get is sort of what is the 
the regulatory framework, right, that sort of leads to this deplatforming. And, and Lola mentioned like the moral encoding in these algorithms, right? And a lot of times, um, not in all cases, but in the case of a lot of large platforms. So if we think about PayPal or we think about Facebook or we think about Airbnb, uh, these are platforms that started in the U.S., right? And so a lot of times the U.S., um, internet regulation context can influence how these platforms um, react. And so there's sort of this U.S. moral encoding um, that gets put in these platforms. Um, and that means that people might not have access to the platforms for business, right, as, as Lola mentioned, for being able to take payments um, et cetera, they may get flagged and they may get banned for life from the platform, even if the work that they're doing is legal and registered in the country um, in which they're doing it. The other thing that it means that we got a number of reports about, and there have been news articles about as well, is that people can get banned from platforms um, even for just being identified as a sex worker. So like Airbnb has a patent um, that uses mysterious machine learning in order to identify uh, people who, for a variety of different reasons, they don't want to use Airbnb. And so even if you, say, have three different devices, one for your sex work, one for your personal work, and then one just for Airbnb, which one person described to us, Airbnb was still able to determine that they are a sex worker and ban them from using Airbnb, even though they didn't want to use it for their work. They just wanted to, to stay for vacation. Um, and so there's this sort of regulation of your identity as someone who works in a particular area versus just the work itself, both of which are problematic, but that sort of shows the depth to which this um, kind of moral encoding can go. Um, this kind of deplatforming, right, also creates invisibility. Um, and Lola has much more uh, experience, I'm sure you could share about this, but some of the folks that we spoke with talked about um, the fact that even if they were working in a country where sex work was legal, they still wanted to do activism or share articles about sex work regulations, et cetera. Um, and so when there is kind of platform policing of any conversations, let's say about commercial sex work, um, that can lead to the community becoming sort of invisible online, um, which can have problems for uh, community activism and worker rights and so forth. Um, the second piece that I wanted to pick up on was this idea of sort of what are the digital tools, right? Um, and Lola mentioned this, this idea of you have these separate accounts and you have these separate devices and you try to keep the information separate on them. Um, and that can be really challenging and really overwhelming for folks, right? Like Lola mentioned, this is not brainless work. This is something that takes a lot of effort. Um, and so from the kind of developer side, one of the things we think about a lot is that in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, kind of existing privacy tools, things like privacy settings, et cetera, those kind of aren't good enough, right? They aren't trustworthy enough. There are sometimes software errors, et cetera. And so folks are really having to kind of roll their own options, like having separate devices. Um, and so is there space for us to do development or research that would, say, allow for hardware segmentation on a single device where you could guarantee that this, the you know, signature of the devices would look different, et cetera? Um, are there other tools that one could design to kind of help people manage these separate profiles? Um, because that idea is not how um, many internet platforms were designed, right? They want you to have one profile that they aggregate all of this data about. And so how do we kind of um, push against that through the development of tools? Um, a, a secondary point in tool development uh, is that often when we think about developing privacy tools, we think of one individual using this tool, right? But in some cases, uh, it's both the client and the worker who need to be able to use the tool. So like Lola brought up cryptocurrency, right? One of the things that we heard from folks was, I really don't use cryptocurrency that much, not necessarily because of my own comfort level, but because my clients don't know how to use it. And, you know, just like I can't ask my employer to necessarily pay me in cryptocurrency, um, because that would be like a lot of effort for them to figure out. Uh, there is kind of a two-way relationship here. And so that's a little bit of a different development context 
than what we typically have when we're thinking about um, particular tools. Same thing for, you know, an, an encrypted chat, et cetera. Um, and then the final piece uh, that I wanted to kind of pick up on from the things that Lola raised um, was, you know, that privacy is part of this holistic type of safety, right? So when we think about privacy, sometimes we think about privacy from data aggregation or kind of privacy as a personal right, um, which it absolutely is. Uh, it's also part of this broader sense of safety, right? Am I having my boundaries respected? Do I have physical safety so that someone isn't going to stalk me? Um, do I have uh, the type of safety in which there's actually, you know, uh, someone who can respond when there are problems, right? So if I have a physical safety problem, is law enforcement or whoever I go to going to take those seriously? Um, and the, the digital piece of that, that last component, um, I've heard a lot about recently from folks we've spoken with who do online only work, um, where they're producing content um, or they're doing kind of live video streams um, and they're finding that that content gets um, screen recorded, downloaded, kind of basically stolen and distributed around the internet. And there are not good mechanisms for tracking that content or getting it back. Um, and there's also sometimes the assumption that um, because you're creating intimate content, um, you must be consenting it for it to go everywhere on the internet. Um, but that's not the case, right? You might be consenting to put your content in one particular place for one particular audience. You're not consenting for it to go everywhere. Um, and so I think from kind of a technologist standpoint, that's making sure that we're building tools, we're building regulation that respects where people are comfortable having their content, where people are comfortable having their data associated with what platforms, what uses, what identities, how do we build tools that kind of make sure that people are able to have uh, that consent-based ownership over their content and over their data? That was it for me. So I observe one really interesting thing from the statements I have so far, and that is we talk about groups here that have completely different awareness of their privacy needs and also completely different ability to act. So what I understand from, from Elisa and Lola right now is that sex workers are very much aware and very consciously choose the services and devices and whatever they, they want to work with to control what they can control. Um, but for example, for the children, the statement we had by Tommaso before, or the people on the move, the example I introduced earlier or that we've learned from in, in the previous panels, um, the situation is different, right? So people on the move, for example, are often very much aware from my personal experience, but they just consent to everything because they have no choice. But they are so much under pressure to um, use whatever communications infrastructure they have to find some short-term employment or to get access to certain funds or certain services that they really have no choice to choose the platform. And for children, I think it's it's even further on that spectrum. They use what their parents give them, and the awareness is often not there. So I'm, I'm trying to push this back to Tommaso. How can we deal with these different levels of awareness and of ability to act upon the awareness? Well, um, the, the problem that, that you perfectly identified, it's exactly one of awareness. I mean... On the one hand, you have people, so th there's privacy, which is uh, at different levels, uh, still brought up as a, a fundamental, fantastic human right. So on the one hand, you have, again, sex workers who need the privacy to be in, dig in, digital, con in, in, digital, in digital platforms, whereas you have kids or children in which um, they, they still would like to use those the, 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 the same platforms, but without having the risk that they don't even know they're, they're, they're running right now. And the problem is um, not only of, of they themselves, but also like of the type of regulation that are being I, I, um, designed so to protect them and which rely on, again, consent and notice and consent and telling you like what are the risks. But again, as as also Elisa just just mentioned right now, it's a it's a problem of contextual integrity. 
So um, this, the, the, the fact that a, a, a naked picture is in a platform for, I don't know, for, a, 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 for sexual workers is a thing. If that same picture is on a billboard, it's, it's the same exact thing, but in different contexts. Contexts. So we go, we go back again to the contextual integrity. And for children, um, other than, you know, like kind of tweaking and reading the right of, of privacy under the new lenses of, of, um, of freedom of thought, there's, there's not much else other than technical solutions that, um, that you yourself devised. But your reasoning in the framework of freedom of thought is, for example, uh, at least I don't see it yet, it's not applicable, for example, the sex worker case. Mm, I wouldn't say so. And the reason is that uh, the fact that we can apply the, 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 um, the right to freedom of thought, it's, it, has, it has two reasoning mainly. One is um, the fact that children are still developing their thoughts Therefore, manipulation can have not only longer effects, but more critical effects. That's one thing. Um, and second is there is, thanks to the uh, General Comment 25 of the UNCRC, there is a reference in the law now, which, by the way, the DSA um, references to. So now it's not that far-fetched that we can actually use the right to right in the, the, um, the right of freedom of thought as the last line of defense uh, against manipulation for children. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Lola, you mentioned at some point that you have good collaborations with Red Lights, which is one of the platforms that is heavily used for, for sex workers to advertise their services in Belgium. Can you maybe say a little bit about how that collaboration works and what the platform is doing to make it a safe space for the people you support? Um, yeah, it's definitely a safer space um, because I think it's a platform that also uh, recognizes its, um, its resp responsibility of uh, hosting advertisements. Uh, in a very sensitive field for where people are also actively fighting against human trafficking and um, child pornography and all of these things. So it's really important that there's also a moderation happening on this, these parts, which is happening. So there are moderators who actively uh, kind of do screening of the profiles and um, give tools for people to uh, inform them about what is legal and what's not and how to act on it, which I think is really important as users or, um, I mean, as clients or workers. Uh, there is also the opportunity to report bad clients. So you can, there's a, not a lot of websites or like web pages that um, have the opportunity to alert someone, but then again, there's, I don't think there's a, a nuanced way of doing it. And if it's a page full of phone numbers, I'm also critical about like, how do we then, if we get a text message or a phone call from someone in, at the same time, screen it uh, in the list of phone numbers, um, how can we centralize or like automatize um, blocking certain type of numbers that could be also like thinking a bit in the future, but yeah, in these ways definitely by by making sure there uh, it's not a, a total moral free website, meaning that um, yeah, harm can be done as well. We don't have to be naive. Of course, there's people who are out to to have um, bad intentions. So I think I really like to put them out as a, as a good uh, example on this. Yeah, quite interesting. I think so, yeah. so these, these rating schemes exist for many things, like for Uber drivers and for Uber clients and whatever. But I do have a feeling that they're in no case actually legitimate. So I, I, I'm, I'm worried about all this data collection from all sides, whether it's for good intentions or for bad intentions. Yeah, I can understand. Maybe just like adds up to the to the whole data pool. 
um, but then it's also like combining a desire to also have more of like a general or like more extensive profile. If it's about who you would like to work with, it could be nice to see like, oh, this is actually someone who has had um, good experiences with his client. Oh, he looks attractive. Then it becomes more of like a mutual exchange but maybe that's already a luxury or like that's already looking ahead a bit um but in terms of like sex positivity it could be a good way to develop as well but then how do you do this how do you like apply this without complicating things further and leaving more traces yeah i think one piece too that sort of interlace through um, both what Tomasa and Lila have, have mentioned is, um, you know, can we shift toward better partnership in some cases, right, between the platform and the end user? So a lot of times I think when we talk about privacy, we think about it as sort of like uh, anti-platform or adversarial or something like that. And platforms in a way are often designed in this sort of carceral or adversarial way, right? Like people post content and then the content gets taken down and they're punished for having posted something incorrect, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so one of the things that we've been thinking about a bit is like, what, what does it look like when, um, say, a platform provides a transparency tool where someone can, say, pre-upload an image and get told whether or not that's permitted on the website, right? Like, this is something I think Lola was sort of mentioning about what happens if that gets moved up earlier so it's sort of collaborative um, between the platform and the end users to make the kind of community they want. Um, similarly, what would it look like if you know, platforms got votes from users that they aggregated um, in a reasonable way around kind of what kind of privacy protections they might prefer. Um, obviously, that has to be balanced again, like against what, um, you know, makes the platform viable to operate. Um, but there is a lot of opportunity here, I think, to create more partnerships um, where all of the stakeholders have a voice. Um, for example, you know, clients and workers and uh, whatever the platform's needs are in terms of uh, monetization. Uh, so I think that's one piece as well that would make people feel like they uh, have more autonomy and might actually realize more autonomy as opposed to being in this situation where you're kind of stuck um, with the tools that are available. So community-driven governance. Tommaso, do you think that could work in a children and parent context with with um, game providers? Hmm. Um, the law is there. <laughs> the law is there. Human rights are there. I mean, I mean, it, it enough with the, the law, which is catching up with the technology. No, law was there already. Human rights were there already. So how about we... we I mean, again, it, it's a matter of, uh, again, how do you enforce it? But the law, it's uh, nice nice enough. So it, it really is a matter of enforcement at some point. And whether that's, that's governance-based, uh, well, uh, yes, to some extent, I'm, I'm fine with it. Um, but in, in certain, so we need to understand that there are some specifics and some characteristics of some vulnerable yeah, digital users, and that some types of business models and cannot be used on those types of, vulner of vulnerabilities. You cannot make money out of children. That's 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 as easy as I, I, I can make it. There is also the question in the chat whether you know of of resources or or anything that allows children as individuals to better fend for themselves against such threats. Um, I'm, I'm kind of wondering if that even makes sense. Um, you mean, should really children be the last yeah, line of defense? Should we enable children defense? or should children be the last line of defense? Um, children are meant to play and fall and back up and getting back up again. And these and the data that we collect while, the, while they fall and, and while they make stupid videos online should not be used against them in 10 years' time, nor used right now. To, uh, to 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 strike collecting data that will I don't know in ten years time make their 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 
insurance, uh, health insurance more and more expensive. That's, that's, I, I don't stand it. I can't. Uh, it's not, it's not have, it does not have to be on children, nor on their parents. It's too complicated. Yeah, yeah, I think that's important to make a point. Also for their parents, it is often too important to understand what data is being collected, where, and, and, and what it might potentially be useful. Um, so Luisa says we have five minutes left. Um, last round, how do you, if, if you're in a, in a world where, you, where all your choices will come through, uh, how, how do you anticipate platforms to be governed in a future to care for the community that you work with? Two minutes each, or, or one minute each. Elisa, if you want to go. I see you smiling. <laughs> sure, I was like, oh, that's a hard question and a good question. Um, I guess kind of picking up, right, this community-driven uh, governance piece, there's been increasing interest in uh, what they call like decentralized online platforms, right? So if we think about things like Macedon, uh, et cetera. And I think one of the interesting things that I expect to see change there, whether it's for those platforms or even platforms like Reddit, et cetera, is kind of recognition of the labor involved in moderation or the labor involved in doing community-driven governance. Um, and so I imagine that we may see a shift toward more and more kind of paid, whether they're freelance positions or et cetera, paid positions um, to allow for uh, more community-driven moderation, possibly in these kind of decentralized communities. Lola, your opinion? Yeah, it's nice to think about like um, idealization of these things. Um, so I, as I say, I'm not an expert on all the like the digital, but what I see would be like how I see it. What would be amazing is if we would give more um, voice and platform to uh, field organizations as well to be able to um, give an evaluation of platforms in way that we are also being heard as users um, and we can have impact in, in, uh, on this level that the evaluation comes from the experiences I gather and collect, let's say, and um, we as uh, non-experts and academics uh, and researchers on the digital spaces uh, also have autonomy would be my very simplified answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do, do you know when we were all kids and we were with our friends playing in our rooms and then the parents would come in and they would like just stop all at once doing whatever yeah, it happens we're doing. Every day. Yes, that happens every day, right? So how about that type of privacy space for children themselves? Like, I mean, um, a place where even, even when willing to, um, um, there's no centralization. So of course, decentralized systems, definitely decentralized systems. Of course, in our case, it cannot be um, um, let's say, uh, um, governed by children themselves, um, but giving to decentralization the, the, the biggest, um, I'll put it this way, uh, making sure that, that the, the system is decentralized to a point where um, no one can enter in the room and, and prey on, on kids' bank. Okay. I think it's 4.20 and with this we have to finish. I'm sorry for the hiccups at the beginning and thanks everyone for listening to us and I hope we, we all learned something about how we can maybe uh, build platforms better. Thank you everyone. Thank you.